Good afternoon. My name is Judith Erika Major, and I'm going to um, introduce you tonight our two presenters, Professor Rin Odawara, who is an associate professor at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, and uh, Sanjay Vipula, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Kyushu University. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Rin Odawara, who is going to talk about a difficulty in remembering the innocent dead, masculine, Jose Ardentine, at and Italy's post war national identity. So let me just give presenter rights to you, Professor. Okay, thank you for introducing me. I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, interesting seminar. Well, my presentation topic is a masculine of civilians by German army in Italy and how the incident has been used in terms of making Italian national identity in post-war era. On March 24, 1944, the German army occupying the northern part of Italy took 335 Roman citizens to the caves named uh, Fosse Ardeatine near the city of Rome and shot them to death. After the execution, they exploded the approach to the caves to conceal the event. This massacre at the Fosse Ardeatine was done as a retaliation following the surprising attack against the occupation army committed by some partisans on the day before, March 23. The year before, in July 1943, an anti-Mussolini group in the fascist party had launched a coup d'etat to force the fall of Benito Mussolini. After making truth with the Allied forces, Italy declared war upon Germany in October as a co-belligerent state of the Allies. This left Northern Italy under German military control. The German army also effectively ruled Rome, the open city, which had lost all defenses. However, the resistance movement systematically opposed the occupation. The German SS and army battered and killed these resistant partisans, but mass slaying of civilians also took place. The massacre of the Fosse Aldeatine is one of them. The day after the massacre in the Fosse Aldeatine, a communique announced by the German command appeared in the newspapers in Rome. During the afternoon of March 23, 1944, criminal elements carried out an attack by throwing bombs at the German police column which was passing along Via Radella. In consequence of this attack, 32 German policemen were killed and several wounded. This vile ambush was carried out by Badoglio communist elements. Investigation is still being carried to clarify up to which point this criminal act is to be attributed to Anglo-American incitement. The German command is firmly determined to put an end to the activity of these heartless bandits. No one shall sabotage unpunished the renewed Italo-German cooperation. The German command, therefore, has given orders that for every German kill, 10 Badoglio communist criminals will be shot. This order has already been carried out. In, commun in the communique, the word Badoglio, who had taken the regime, was juxtaposed with communists. Obviously, he is not communist but regarded as one of the worst enemies of the Nazi fascists. Germans viewed that all Italians were regarded as the enemy of Germany and decided to execute their attribution within 24 hours and did exactly so. For the 32 dead Germans, 335 citizens became victims of the retaliation and the confused situation. The Osservatore Romano, Vatican's official organ, commented on the incident on March 26. I skip this uh, to read, but you can see the, the text on the, on the slide. 
In the Vatican's interpretation, the 32 dead and 320 people killed for the retaliation of the attack by the occupying army are on the same level as victims, and the responsibility of the massacre is definitely due to the victims. I would like to draw attention and here to the narrative in which the attack by partisans and the massacre of the Fossel d'Antini are directly related as a cause and a result. The German army claimed the massacre as revenge for the attack, and as a bystander, the Vatican accepted the story as is. Yet, can partisans be responsible for the death of the victims of the Fossel d'Antini? This question is still provocative because the discourse is closely linked with the issue of the formation and reformation of Italy's national identity, in which the memory of war and the dead plays an important role. Let me show an example. The Italian center-left newspaper La Repubblica carried out an article on the Fossel di Atene on August 7, 2007 titled Code of Cassation, via La Zella's act of war, Il Giornare, convicted for defamation. Il Giornare is a daily newspaper owned by Paolo Berlusconi, brother of Silvio Berlusconi, the notorious former prime minister. A family member of the leader of a rightist party had instigated a campaign in 1996 against the partisans who carried out the attack in which published news articles assigned the partisan members with the responsibility for the massacre of the Fossel de Atene. The article in La Repubblica conveys the chaotic context in which the incident of the Fossel de Atene exists in contemporary Italian history and memory. According to the article, the Court of Cassation rejected the campaign by confirming the sentence of compensation for defamation in favor of the partisan members. The sentence of the court accused Il Giornare, the newspaper, uh, of deliberate factual falsity about the nationality of the attacked German soldiers, their equipment, and the number of, the number of civilian victims. And the court also addressed the issue of historical revisionism, a tendency that criticizes the role of the resistance in order to lessen the burden of the past of fascism in Italian history. This arose in the 1990s in the middle of Italy's biggest political change half century after the Second World War. At that time, the political parties, such as Christian Democracy, Italian Socialist Party, and the Italian Communist Party, which had composed the anti-fascist movement and had been predominant based on the legitimacy of resistance in post-war Italy, declined, and the new rightist powers, such as Forza Italia of Berlusconi and Northern League, emerged. This new rising political power has utilized the nation's history of, and memory to drag down the traditional parties. The paper discourse of the rightists has emphasized instead the misconducts committed by the partisans and have relatively diminished the fascists' responsibility for the invasion the other of, uh, of other countries and the devastation of their violence. Quote, Therefore, it can be considered the non-correspondence to the truth of circumstances not marginal, such as the further equation of partisans and Nazis with referring to the aggression of Pierre Zella, could be detrimental to personal and political vulnerability." End quote. In fact, nothing is unclear about the part an attack and the following massacre from the viewpoint of historical studies. The investigation of the massacre itself started right after the liberation of Rome. U.S. forces, which arrived in Rome on June 4, 1944, formed a committee for truth-finding to examine the massacre, excavated the site, and identified the dead bodies. American journalist Robert Katz it reconstructed the partisan attack and the process of the retaliation through U.S. Army documents, judicial documents, newspaper coverage, and so on. 
His work clarified the essential timeline of the two events. Immediately after the attack, the German dead were initially counted as 28. The German command had to make a list of 280 candidates for death in order to kill 10 Italians for every dead German soldier and to execute the order so that the reprisal would be accomplished within 24 hours. They filled the list with 57 people who were sentenced to death, life and long-term imprisonment, had been arrested on the suspicion of anti-fascist action and confined in the German secret police's prison or were waiting for deportation because of being Jewish. Then the list included, included 10 citizens living near the site of the attack and spies of the Allied forces, etc. Et in the meantime, five more soldiers died of their wounds and the dead increased from 28 to 32. At dawn on March 24, they completed the list of 270. The remaining 50 were offered by the fascists, that is, by the Italians. The execution had to be done rapidly within 24 hours and secretly to not to not to, to not incite a disturbance among the Roma citizens. For these reasons, they chose the caves left after from mining and throughout which the catacomb of ancient Rome spread. Finally, 330 people were listed after the wrong notice that 33 Germans had died. They were shot to death one after another by SS captain and other 74 German soldiers. Eventually, 335 were executed. Five more were killed by mistake. Looking to the occupations and the ages of the victims, they were diverse. It includes policemen, peddlers, architects and engineers, soldiers, public employees, lab laborers, farmers, priests, students, etc. Their ages ranged between 15 for the youngest and 74 for the oldest as far as could be proved. Recent studies speculate that the number included 75 or 76 Jewish citizens. The construction of the monument at, at the site started in November 1947. The monument would be inaugurated two years later on the fifth anniversary of the massacre. The ceremony is held on March 24 every year. Alessandro Portelli, oral historian who collected the testimonies of the families of the victims and the Roman citizens who remembered the incident, pointed out two hasty reactions of Roman citizens upset by the sudden and excess death. One was to blame the partisans for the Fossiar di Atene. The other was to put the various dead into a single category, such as they were all Jewish, or they are all communists, or all criminals. Both of these reactions are efforts to identify the reason of death, but the fact kept tormenting bereaved families. A victim's relative noted that, what? Assigning responsibility to the partisans is instinctive. I guess it's a gut reaction, but we are made of guts and brain. In the beginnings, yes, you must understand. They tell you he set off, the, he set off a bomb and because of that, they all. Even sources above suspicion, like the Osservatore Romano, who put the partisans and the German reaction on the same plane. There really was a process, a work of misinformation, the machine that I took for this sentiment, end quote. As if the confused emotion was reflected, there were two narratives of commemoration in the ritual. At the ceremony, Christian democracy claimed their legitimacy as an elected moderate and Catholic regime, while the length claimed in the school outside to be to be protagonists of the resistance at the people's movement.
both positions framed themselves as anti-fascists and shared a single representation of the reborn nation despite of their political confrontation. It, it, made, this site, it made this site of memory into a national monument. However, taking any form of collective mon commemoration, it should oppress personal intimate mourning. Fourth, there is something artificial to it of canopies and stuff. It made me angry and I told mom, no, I'm not coming to listen to those clowns. I'll just stay here with my father and I'll speak to them, the dead, I'll learn from them. In the book. There we can find a difficulty in remembering the innocent dead, not as a part of something greater, nor as representative of it. In 1944, the next day of the news of the massacre of the citizens in of the citizens in the name of retaliation, the partisan members issued a statement that it was them, them to have done the surprise attack and to continue their struggle for freedom and independence for the innocent 320 victims. At least they, the partisans, knew well the innocence of the lost lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for the informative presentation and uh, I would like to encourage our listeners to submit any questions that they may have. We still have a few minutes for that, so should you have any questions? You can also submit them later via email. Yes. Or you can uh, ask us on our website as you prefer. So let's just give you one more minute. Okay, it seems at this point uh, there are no questions. So thank you very much again thank for you. the very positive presentation. I uh, myself very much enjoy um, history. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is uh, Sanjay Avipula, who is going to talk about recent developments in medical robotics and their applications. Yes, we can see your screen all right, so you're welcome to proceed. I'm sorry, I'm afraid we cannot hear you. Okay, let me try to help with that. Okay, how about now? I guess now it's... Uh... Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. I shall just mute myself. Thank you. Go ahead. Excellent. So thank you, Judith, for the kind introduction and uh, creating this excellent platform to share some of the research uh, we have been doing in this hard time in the global arena with this COVID-19. Uh, sorry. So just, I'm Sanjay. Sorry. Uh, may I just say that your icons are showing at the bottom, so it might actually interfere with your pictures. Um, Is it okay? Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm Sanjay Bandara. I'm currently an assistant professor at the Advanced Medical Systems Laboratory of Kyushu University in Fukuoka, Japan. I'm originally from Sri Lanka. 
So today I'm going to introduce uh, or talk about the recent developments in medical robotics uh, and their applications. Uh, so, so today I'm going to introduce some of the research that I've been doing for the past decade, uh, especially when I was back in Sri Lanka and some of the studies that I have done here in Japan. So what is a robot? Uh, in general, a uh, robot is a machine that can perform a complicated series of tasks uh, by itself. Um, uh, we all know uh, we uh, we have all we all have seen robots uh, in our real life. Uh, but what is what are these specific features uh, incorporated with robots? Uh, they can perform accurate and precise uh, tasks over and over again without getting tired. But uh, for us humans, uh, if we do the same task over and over again, we get tired. But robots are not like that, uh, and uh, uh, they can be small or they can be large uh, as we need or according to the requirement uh, and robots if necessary they they can be remotely operated uh, and especially when the robots uh, uh, when they connect with computers they give most important uh, uh, access to the information uh, and oh, one of the disadvantages with the robots uh, uh, they not always they can operate uh, autonomously, especially in high complex, uh, highly complex and uncertain environments where some kind of human interaction uh, is uh, required to to let the robot know what to do and uh, uh, what kind of uh, operations needs to be done. Uh, so this is briefly uh, what a robot means. And so what are the medical robots? Uh, simply a medical robot is a robot which can be, which is used in the medical industry uh, there are mainly two types uh, first type is the robotics to assist people and then the next uh, main type is the robots to assist uh, doctors or surgeons so in day-to-day -day life we can say the patients and the doctors are the two main uh, one of two main stakeholders in uh, the medical industry so uh, the robots, uh, medical robots can help both these uh, people. Uh, when it comes to robots that assist people, uh, there are mainly two types, uh, robots and machines that improve the quality of life of disabled or elderly people, uh, mainly by increasing the personal independence. Uh, for example, there are some uh, robotic devices such as prosthetic devices, um, uh, which are artificial uh, substitutes for the lost limbs of a human uh, or orthotic devices which can be worn outside the body uh, which uh, we known as exoskeletons or some technologies like functional electrical stimulation FES. Uh, and on the other hand rehabilitation robots uh, uh, they can be used uh, in clinical therapy uh, especially in neuromotor rehabilitation training uh, this is also one of the important uh, area where the medical robots are being used. And on the other, uh, uh, with the other type, the robots to assist doctors and surgeons, uh, there are different types of robots which we can use to, uh, uh, which, uh, to help the surgeons in some of their tasks. For example, uh, when they have to perform a surgery, the robot can assist uh, in their surgery. Uh, one of the well-known uh, surgical ro robots available is the Da Vinci. Uh, and they can help uh, in investigating the human body in different ways. Uh, and also, uh, it, which they can help in diagnosis uh, of the, uh, the different types of uh, health conditions of the human. So today, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, one of each, uh, one robot from each category, which I've been doing. Uh, uh, so what are the impact of uh, the medical robotics? Uh, if we say the challenge versus the number of patients of a certain, certain uh, medical procedure, uh, with the traditional procedures, if there is a high challenge, the number of patients that can be treated is uh, getting low. Uh, but with the introduction of the robots, uh, the challenge level will go down eventually when we introduce a robot to, to replace or to support a surgeon or some kind of medical procedure. Uh, 
So with that, we can reach to higher number of patients, more importantly, with high efficiency and uh, more user-friendly environment. Uh, so using robots simply will uh, improve the uh, reachability of the uh, medical procedures to the mankind. Uh, so the first uh, tri robot I'm going to introduce is on the uh, robots to assist people. This is study I mainly did when I was back in Sri Lanka at the University of Moratua. Uh, so uh, the robots to assist uh, humans, they can be mainly, uh, I'm, I'm going to today focus on the wearable robotic systems. So mainly wearable robotic systems are uh, the robotic systems that can be worn, for example, as I mentioned in a few slides ago, so the robots like prosthetic hands or exoskeleton systems, where, where we can, the, the, the patient or an amputee can wear them to support their daily living activities uh, uh, when they can't perform certain, uh, certain things by their own. Uh, and this is the research landscape. Uh, as you can see, the, the medical robotics or, or even the, the, the broader robotics is not uh, a single individual uh, research area. So it's a, it's a, broad, it's a collection of broad uh, uh, research areas and the final outcome is depending on all of these categories. So today I'm going to introduce in the next slide one of the designs that I have been doing on the transhumanal uh, prosthetic arm. This is a prosthetic arm that can be used to substitute an above elbow amputee. Uh, above elbow amputee is a person who has lost his arm above the elbow. Uh, so this uh, robot should be able to substitute for the elbow, forearm, and the wrist and the hand part of the human. Uh, so it has 15 degrees of freedom. Uh, mainly it can generate the elbow motion, it can generate the forearm motion, and then the two wrist motions, and uh, again, another 11 types of motion of the human hand. And as you can see here, uh, this is the uh, main uh, uh, component, main mechanical uh, components responsible for the elbow motion, and here this is the main mechanical component responsible for the uh, wrist, uh, sorry, the forearm, supination and pronation, uh, and here you can see the parallel link mechanism, which is responsible for the uh, two wrist motions, wrist flexion extension and the wrist ulnar radial deviation. Uh, especially in this parallel link mechanism, uh, in humans, when we do the wrist motions, uh, it, uh, the two wrist motions has a change of the center of rotation. So no, in this robot, the robot can compensate this wrist center of rotation in its uh, design. So this is one of the advantages of this uh, robot. And at the end effector, it has three motors uh, to generate 11 degrees of freedom. Uh, and uh, in the finger, it has in the one of the, uh, in the finger mechanism, we have two internal links with uh, sliding joints. Uh, so when the finger grasps a certain object, uh, according to the dimensions or according to geometry of the object, this uh, sliding joint can move uh, up and down uh, depending on the spring tension. So when, uh, th therefore the, the finger joints can adapt according to the uh, geometry of the grasping object. So it can generate uh, five different types of grasping uh, patterns uh, It's in its terminal. Uh, and this is the uh, developed prototype of, uh, of the prosthetic arm, which is at the University of Moroto of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, next, uh, uh, the most, uh, one of the important factors uh, uh, when it comes to these kind of prosthetic arms or the exoskeleton systems, as you can see here, uh, is the controlling. Uh, so this is, this, is worn by, uh, this is worn by a certain uh, individual human uh, so the robot should be able to support the uh, intended motion of the human. Uh, for this purpose, we are currently using different types of biosignals. Uh, I'm introducing you two of them today, the electromyography, which is a uh, measurement of the uh, electrical uh, signal from the human muscle. Uh, it is, uh, we can measure the potential of the muscle from the uh, surface of the muscle or even from the inside of the muscle invasively and it will make, uh, we can use this electrical pulse or electrical uh, signal 
to determine what is the motion intention of the uh, wearer. And also another important uh, uh, biosignal is the electroencephalography, which is the brain signal in, uh, simply uh, where we can measure an electrical signal from the scalp of the uh, wearer. As you can see here, the, we can measure electrical signals uh, using electrodes and these uh, electrical pulses can, will generate according to the thoughts, or according to the uh, behavior of the brain and they can be used to control uh, a human motion. Uh, they can be used to estimate the human motion intention. So I'm introducing you uh, two of the studies that we carried out. Uh, in this study, we try to identify the motion intention to uh, perform uh, two activities of daily living, uh, moving uh, of the human hand and the drinking. Uh, so here we first measure EEG, EM, EEG the brain signals from, uh, the, from a subject, and then we acquire these brain signals, and then we analyze these brain signals uh, in an offline technique to understand the uh, uh, behavior of the EEG patterns, and then we use these uh, understandings uh, in, ma in machine learning techniques and different kind of signal processing techniques to uh, uh, classify or the estimate the human motion intention. So with the proposed method that we propose, if we were able to understand or we were, we were able to estimate the human motion intention uh, at 70% uh, accuracy. And in the next uh, study I'm going to introduce, we try to estimate the motion intention of an amputee, uh, which is, uh, uh, for example, uh, as I previously introduced the prosthetic arm, if for, let's assume this uh, amputee is wearing this prosthetic arm, so he only has the shoulder uh, amputated uh, stump arm. Uh, so we use this, we use the shoulder angle of this stump arm and also the recordings of EEG from the human, uh, from the brain to estimate the human motion intention. So here we first uh, use EEG to understand the trigger for the motion, whether he wants to move the hand or not. And then we use the uh, shoulder angle to control the other parameters uh, that is necessary to control the uh, human, uh, the, to control the prosthetic. Uh, so in this study, we were able to successfully estimate the motion intention at around 67% accuracy in average. Uh, so in the next part of the uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce you uh, the second type of uh, one of these studies on the second type of the uh, uh, medical robots, which is used to, to robotics to assist doctors or the surgeon. This study was carried out in Kyushu University uh, with the collaboration of the University of Tokyo and uh, also my current uh, uh, head of the lab uh, with uh, Professor Junpei Arata. Uh, so here uh, we use the uh, motion intention, so we use the uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery uh, as our main focus. Uh, so minimal invasive surgery is one of the uh, well-known uh, uh, surgical procedures uh, where we can insert instruments uh, to the small incisions of the human body, and then we can use these uh, instruments to perform certain uh, surgeries inside the human. But one of the problems with the robotically assisted uh, minimal invasive surgery is current uh, uh, robotic devices are, uh, are large and they cannot be inserted into human body, especially into the uh, most inner areas of the human body. Uh, they are inaccessible for human, uh, for robotically assisted uh, uh, forceps. So in this study, we introduce uh, robotically, uh, robotically assisted forceps. Uh, they are miniaturized. So we hope the miniaturized manipulations will make it possible to use the robotic instruments, uh, especially in uh, surgeries like neurosurgery, uh, pediatric, pediatric surgery, where the uh, robotically assisted minimal invasive surgery is not being done at the, at the at the moment. So what are the significant features of uh, this this study? Uh, this is expected to be used in deep, narrow areas of the human body, as I mentioned. As you can see, the forceps, uh, which, which are shown here, they can be inserted through the nose uh, to do some surgical procedures in the pituitary. Um, and it has four degrees of freedom, uh, grasping, two bending motions at the uh, uh, two perpendicular axis, and the rotation of the whole body uh, in its own axis. And it has a simple structure, uh, which is uh, a 
a combination of two types of uh, springs, spring A and spring B, and another six parts, uh, which is connected at the tip of the forceps with the pin joint. So uh, it is it is really tiny. It is 3.5 millimeters in diameter. Uh, the whole whole system is 3.5 millimeters in diameter, and the tip is only three millimeters in diameter. Uh, and the other important thing is the, the forceps is detachable from its actuation unit and it can be directly used for sterilization. Uh, and it has a higher repeat accuracy. Uh, with the bending, it has 0 0.064 degrees repeat accuracy, and with grasping, it has 0 0.05 degrees of repeat accuracy. And um, the grasping force, another important factor, it has five point, it can generate 5.8 newtons of grasping force and the uh, the as i mentioned it can be detached so it can be used in multiple uh, surgeries so for now we have tested this device with uh, fatigue test and it can bend over 8000 cycles with in the spring we where the springs are made of nickel titanium alloy so uh, it can it can be used in multiple operations and this is how we do this and this is the uh, main uh, design um, So the two springs are attached at the pin joint, and in the next slide you can see how the motion is generated. Uh, so when the two two springs move back and forth, it can bend because of the elasticity of the used material nickel titanium. Uh, and this is uh, in the in the computer simulations and in the real prototype you can see how we generate the back and forth mechanism uh, when we move the back and forth these four these springs it can generate bending motion and for grasping what we do is we just uh, push and pull both the springs together so that it can generate the uh, grasping motion and uh, we implemented this system with uh, the support of uh, university of tokyo and this is this uh, video demonstrate how we can perform a uh, suturing task uh, uh, at the uh, artificial membrane of the dura matter uh, of the so this procedure was done by a surgeon uh, at the university of tokyo uh, so this uh, the robot can be successfully used to uh, do a suturing task uh, that's all and uh, thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. It's quite exciting, actually, what developments have been made. Um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, may I encourage our audience to submit questions? You may type them into the questions box. You can find the questions uh, box right under the attendee list, if you can actually see that. Alternatively, I can simply encourage you to write an email to either our professor or to us, your access Japan. Any questions at this point? Okay, it seems that um, our audience is our audience is not having any questions at the moment. So I would like to thank all of you for uh, participating in today's webinar. And thank our presenters for coming and taking time. I'd like to invite further presenters to contact us and talk about their research in future webinars. So if you yourself would like to present or know anyone who would be interested, please send us an email at japan at euroxcess.net. Thank you again so much for coming. I'm looking forward well, to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the audience. Frequent presentations. Thank you.